Okay, welcome to the next uh, Faroe lecture. Uh, we're really excited to uh, uh, continue uh, uh, this series. We had a little hiatus for our workshop in February, and that went well with uh, over 100 people. I won't uh, go over that, but it, uh, I think it worked as a hybrid meeting. At least that's what I've heard from uh, both uh, on site and uh, hybrid participants. But now we're back to our uh, monthly uh, series on the uh, second Thursday uh, of each month. And we're really excited today oops, let's see, to have uh, Hong Zhang Xiao, uh, professor of physics at uh, Jilin University in China. And he's going to talk about electric uh, Zhelazhinsky Maria like interactions in ferroelectrics and anti ferroelectrics. So, Hong Zhang Xiao uh, got his PhD in material science in 2015, and then he was in Luxembourg as a postdoc, and then he uh, 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 became a uh, professor uh, at Jinlin University in China, and he works on a theory of really uh, interesting uh, problems in ferroelectrics and related materials, and uh, so we're really excited about it. After his talk, there will be a chance to uh, uh, ask uh, questions from the audience, uh, from your, the participants. And um, so you can type them in. You can actually type them in during the talk, but they'll only be asked after the talk is over. If you have an extensive question, you can type in that you would like to uh, ask it in person and then you, I mean, uh, live, and then we can promote you or try to promote you uh, to audio and video. And you can ask your uh, question live if it's something uh, extensive. That'll be up to us whether we do it. I want to thank uh, uh, Cyrus, um, uh, Cyrus uh, Dreyer for uh, joining us as a panelist today. So he'll be uh, there also during the discussion period. So he's at uh, Stony Brook University in the Flatiron Institute, one of the uh, members of the organizing committee. I want to thank the organizing committee, but first let me just mention we've had a series of this starting April 2021. You can see videos of all of the talks. The links are on the website. And they're also on, on YouTube. And uh, we're excited that uh, next month, April 14th, Alexander uh, Demkov will give a talk on ferroelectric thin films for integrated silicon phonics. And I want to thank the organizing committee, Laurent Blaise, uh, Cyrus Dreyer, Jorge Inaguez, and uh, Beth Noah, Nick, for uh, helping uh, organize this series. And I also want to mention, just so you can uh, put it on your calendar, is we do have a uh, date uh, and place for the next uh, uh, workshop on fundamental physics of ferroelectrics. It'll be in Golden, Colorado at the Colorado School of Mines, uh, February 5th to 8th, 2023. It's always planned to be the week before the Super Bowl. So if you wanna know when it is, you can look at it ahead 10 years or something. So anyway, so uh, um, there's a website already for the meeting, but there's nothing really on it yet. But if you would like to help organize that meeting, please let me know. So without any further ado, um, uh, I will turn it over to our speaker and you can uh, uh, share your uh, slides, uh, um, Hong Shen. Okay. So thank you, and we'll, we're looking forward <laughs> okay. to hearing. Okay. Uh, me, please. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. So uh, it is my great pleasure to give a talk in this Ferro Electro. So my name is Meng Jian Zhao. I am from Jilin University, and the topic is about uh, electric Zhelazhinsky Maria interaction in ferroelectrics and anti ferroelectrics. So this work is done in collaboration with Dr. Peng Qian, a professor of circuit procedure, and Dr. Sergei Atayuki and Professor Luan Bilesh. So this work actually is done when I was a postdoc in University of Arkansas at uh, Professor Luan Bilesh Research Group. Uh, in this talk, basically, I will first uh, briefly introduce the Heisenberg exchange interaction and the Alashinsky maria interaction in the magnetic regime. Then I will show you some nonlinear phenomena in magnetic and uh, electric regimes. Then I will tell you what motivates us to think the existence of uh, electric the Shinsky-Maria interaction. So there will be some symmetry argument. 
then how to prove its existence. So in this part, I will outline, for example, uh, the nonlinear magnetism in some uh, rare spherite is originated from a magnetic Zelensky Maria interaction. Then uh, we also know that some structural distortion can lead to this uh, nonlinear magnetism. Hence, the structural distortion is linked with magnetic uh, DMI. So then I will briefly introduce, for example, the structural distortion will result in some nonlinear dipole pattern as well. So in the same way as the nonlinear magnetism uh, originated from the structural distortion. So by constructing this, uh, we have a connection between electric DMI and magnetic DMI. So by the way, in this talk, I will use DMI for short uh, uh, of the Zelensky Maria interaction. Finally, I will make a summary. So first, uh, about uh, the Heisenberg exchange interaction. So this is the interaction coupling two magnetic moments. So on set I and set J, the coupling strength is given by J. So if J is positive, then uh, Mi and Mj tend to be anti-parallel to reduce the energy. Uh, if J is negative, then Mi and Mj tend to be parallel. So overall, has the Heisenberg exchange interaction will result in the collinear magnetism say parallel or anti-parallel for the neighboring uh, magnetic moments. Then in the mid last century, so uh, the physicist uh, Zelensky discovered uh, uh, interaction so called magnetic DMI. So this interaction is used to interpret the nonlinear magnetism in ferrites and uh, some other materials. Soon after that, uh, another physicist, uh, Professor Maria, introduced some uh, series uh, giving the macroscopic origin of the magnetic DMI. And it is uh, macroscopically uh, originated from spin orbital coupling. And uh, this formula showed the magnetic DMI interaction. So typically, it is a mixed product uh, form. Uh, this is the interaction coupling the magnetic moment on set I and set J. So Mi and Mj are interact uh, with each other via uh, in intermediate atom K. So when K is located on the Ij line, then no magnetic DMI at all. Once the K is displaced off the Ij line by, for example, D, there will be a finite magnetic DMI the DMI is given is pro proportional to D cross Eij, where Eij is a unit vector pointing from I to J. So for example, in this case, the D vector is uh, perpendicular to the screen. Um, then here we will show, we will see the larger the D, the larger the displacement D, the larger the DMI vector, so the capital D. Then because of the mixed product uh, coupling, Typically, Mi and Mj should be perpendicular to each other to reduce the energy. In a real material, uh, in a real material, typically you have uh, two interactions: so Heisenberg interaction and the DMI interaction. Because of that, so uh, the Mi and Mj typically should be nonlinear, and this are widely observed in some uh, bulk material, for example, the spin canteen in a cimmerium ferrite and some spin sparrow in some bulk magnetic material. So you will clearly see the nonlinear dipole patterns. More than that, there are also some intriguing uh, magnetic phenomena due to MDMI. For example, the magnetic scattering, the magnetic vortex, and uh, also magnetic mirror. So they are termed as uh, magnetic topological uh, defects. Uh, strikingly, in the electric in the electric regime, you will also find, for example, by ab initial or first principles based uh, predictions, there exist uh, uh, electric vortex, electric scattering, and electric mirrors. These uh, striking features are also verified or experimentally observed in some uh, nanostructural materials. Uh, for example, in the lead titanate and strontium titanate superlattices, uh, we can grow, for example, the uh, scattering and vortex. And in lead titanate thin films, the mirror is also observed very recently. Uh, so this leads people to think, uh, because in magnetic regime, the magnetic topological defects 
uh, due to magnetic DMI. Then what about uh, the electric DMI? Is it due to the electric DMI? Typically, people do, do not think like that. So the electric uh, uh, topological defects are likely due to uh, the polarizing field. So how to understand this? We know that when a positive charge and negative charge are separated by a finite a distance, a dipole is formed, pointing from the negative charge to the positive charge. When you have a sequence of dipole at uh, low temperature in ferroelectric, the dipoles uh, tend to be aligned in a parallel way. So you have a dipole alignment uh, like this. Then in a bulk material, if your structure is infinite, so no problem at all. But if you consider a nanostructure cases, you have a boundary. Uh, at the boundary, for example, in the top layer, you can see the positive charge are not comp compensate. Well, in the bottom layer, you have there are some net negative charge. Because of that, there will be some depolarizing field pointing from the top to the bottom. This depolarizing field will interact with the dipole. Uh, to reduce the energy, the dipole has to be realigned. Uh, based on some uh, analysis from Professor Lauren Belich, so typically there are two limiting cases. The first limiting case is the open circuit case. So in this case, the net charge at the boundary are not compensated at all. Typically, you have a lot depriving field. So beta equals zero uh, characterize this case. Another is a short circuit case, so beta equal one. In that case, the net the the surface charge are compensated, so you uh, there will be some screening effect. Then, based on some based on some simulation, for example, one beta is smaller than zero point nine, so you will have some vortex structure. It means uh, even some smaller depriving field will greatly change the dipole pattern from the parallel case to some vortex. So, in that case, uh, there it gives you some twist. Uh, to think that the polarizing field will lead to some uh, electric uh, non-collinear phenomena. Then, of course, here, so one beta is larger, so typically uh, because of the screening, so the polarizing field is tiny, then the dipoles are tend to align uh, in a parallel way. This is for uh, nanostructures. Well, in some bulk material recently, some uh, non-collinear dipole pattern have also been observed. For example, in the uh, business copper manganite outside, there are some dipole spiral, so uh, a counterpart of the spin spiral in magnetic structures. Then in some bulk material, so this is the experimental work published on science. So then based on some initial simulations, uh, for example, in the rare ferrite and the transdern uh, oxygen chloride system, there are also non-collinear dipole patterns. So here the uh, the arrow shows the dipole, uh, the, the dipole. Then in bulk material, so there are no boundaries, then no depriving field. So why non-collinear? Uh, can the non-collinear come from the electric DMI? So this motivated us to think the possible existence of the electric DMI. Then I have to mention a work published recently. So in that work, um, uh, uh, Professor Helinka and his group predict uh, or propose the existence of the electric uh, block scaramine. And in, in, in this work, it was mentioned that this uh, block scaramine happens in a way like uh, uh, the magnetic scaramine, so based on the magnetic excitation scheme real interaction. So, this uh, is another work hinting the electric DMI. So, we raise our question does the electric DMI exist? To argue that, let's make some symmetry arguments, do some symmetry analysis. So in principle, we will argue that if the, the left formula for the magnetic DMI exists, then you will define a similar formula characterizing the electric DMI. By symmetry, we have uh, argued, uh, we have reached this conclusion. Typically, let's analyze the symmetry. For arbitrary system, the spatial time symmetry can, can be classified into four types, the translations, the pure rotations, the time reversal, and the inversion. Let's look at the first two. For the translations, so we define a dipole pointing from the A to A prime. Then we can also define a magnetic moment 
characterizing by a let's say electric current loop flowing from B to C. Uh, based on your right hand, hand rule, you can define a magnetic moment uh, uh, denoted by the blue arrow, so pointing upward. Then let's look at uh, the effect of the translation on these two uh, vectors. After the translation, you will see the you the dipole still pointing upward, the magnetic moment still pointing upward. So say the translation transform the translation symmetry transform the dipole and the magnetic moment in the same way. Now let's look at the pure rotation. For example, you rotate your system by pi over two. After that. So the, the dipole pointing to the right and the magnetic moment pointing to the right. So we can say under translations or pure rotations, the magnetic moment and the dipoles transform in the same way. Now let's look at uh, another tool. So the time reversal and the inversion. Let's look at the time reversal. So time reversal contain time. Then if you put a negative sign in your time, you have a uh, the, the, that's the time reversal transformation. So because the dipole doesn't involve time, so after the time reversal, your dipole doesn't change. Well, the electric current involves time because current uh, equals dq over dt. So after you do the time uh, reversal, so the current from B to C now changes from C to B. After that, your magnetic moment reverses its sign. Then, Let's look at the inversion. Let's assume that the inversion center is, uh, in this case, bisecting A and A prime. Then in this case, it's uh, on the center of the circle. So after inversion, you will see your, electric, your dipole reverse its sign. Well, the magnetic moment doesn't change its sign. So we can see under time reversal, M reverse its sign. Well, under inversion, U reverse its sign. So say, under under time reversal or under inversion, a uh, magnetic moment and uh, uh, electric dipole transform oppositely. But uh, look at uh, when you look at your DMI interaction, for example, in the magnetic regime or in the electric regime, you will see it, it involves some bilinear coupling for the two uh, magnetic moment or bilinear coupling for the two uh, electric uh, dipole. It means the two negative signs will cancel. So in overall, we will see under inversion or time reversal, Mi cross Mj and Ui cross Uj transform identically. So now where are we? We see by symmetry, Mi cross Mj and Ui and Uj are exactly the same. So symmetry cannot uh, distinguish these two uh, physical quantities. Then we see symmetry arguments support the existence of the electric DMI and the MDMI and EDMI, so magnetic and electric DMI, have one-to-one -one correspondence. So that means, in any case, if there is some magnetic DMI, there should be some electric DMI or vice versa. Then there are another question come. So how to prove the existence of the electric DMI? Here we will show the basic spirit. So for them, the basic procedures we are thinking and how we arrive at the conclusion that the electric DMI is, uh, indeed existed. Let us first review some nonlinear magnetism. We see uh, nonlinear magnetism in many cases come from the magnetic DMI. For example, in various ferrites such as the PBM samarium ferrite. Uh, in this case, uh, because of the Heisenberg exchange interaction, the neighboring iron tend to be aligned in an anti-parallel way. So form, let's say, the R-type, we define it as an R-type anti-ferromagnetic structure. Basically, the magnetic moment can be aligned, uh, for example, along x direction or along z direction, and also along some other directions. So here, because of the anti-parallel uh, alignment of the moment on iron. So we shouldn't, uh, so typically we shouldn't expect, expect any magnetism, let's say ferromagnetism in this material. However, when people measure some uh, magnetic properties of a uh, samarium ferrite, people observe the, the magnetic hypothesis loop. So 
it uh, indicates some uh, weak ferromagnetism. So the magnetic uh, magnetic moment is about 0 0.05, typically uh, one percent of the normal ferromagnetic material, such as iron or some uh, other uh, iron cobalt hat and something else. Then, from the magnetic versus temperature measurement, you will see at uh, large temperature the material is pyromagnetism. Then, soon after that, it uh, becomes ferromagnetism, big ferromagnetism along uh, 001, let's say Z direction. Then at uh, temperature of 450, there is a spin reorientation. Now the weak ferromagnetism is along X direction. So how to understand that? If you look at the temperature region of 5 to 600, you will see it's a non-collinear magnetism, so gamma 4 structure. <laughs> Basically, this structure is a superposition of the odd type anti-ferromagnetism along X direction and the gamma type uh, ferromagnetism along Z direction. Now, if you look at uh, the region, uh, the temperature region below 450, you will see it is a gamma 2 non-collinear magnetic structure, which is a superposition of the R type anti-ferromagnetism along Z direction and a gamma type uh, ferromagnetism along X direction. So what, is, what caused this uh, superposition? So for example, why the R type anti-ferromagnetism and the gamma type ferromagnetism Coexist. Why? Technically, we can. Uh, let me recall that uh, the non-collinear ferromagnetism uh, in cimmerium ferrite is ascribed uh, to the uh, magnetic DMI. Now we are going to link it to the geometry. Uh, this is the crystal structure of cimmerium ferrite. It is a distorted uh, version of the pure sky. The high symmetry phase is uh, a cubic one with the PM minus 3M symmetry, so cubic one. Then the for the iron oxygen form uh, octahedral, octahedral connected with each other by the oxygen atoms. Then uh, forming a connection in such a way, so a regular way, uh, without any uh, structural distortion. Then um, Comparing the PMA, PBM and the, the cubic phase, basically there are two kinds of uh, distortions. So first is the antiphase tilting, <laughs> omega r. So this is the uh, this tilting is like this. So for example, in the top layer, the octahedral is rotated in an anti-clockwise way. Well, in the bottom layer, it rotates clockwise. So this leads to uh, the atomic structure in uh, like this. Then if we look at uh, from the top to the bottom, you will have a uh, rotation in such a way. Another type of rotation is the uh, in-phase rotation. Basically, the top layer for them rotate uh, clockwise, while the bottom clockwise as well. Then the atomic structure is given like this. So if you look from the top to the bottom, you have your in-phase rotation. Uh, so it happens in such a way. Now, if you look at the structure in detail, you will see there are some geometry unit uh, like this and the geometry unit like this. So this unit is very similar to the geometry unit characterizing the magnetic zelashinsky maria interaction. So it indicates that the antiphase tilting lead to some electric, uh, the magnetic BMI in perovskite material. <laughs> Say, the uh, tilting is the structure distortion, uh, the structure origin of the magnetic uh, uh, DMI. Uh, how to uh, prove that? So in the year of 2012, Professor Lon Belich and uh, his co-authors published the work. So this, in this work, uh, some correlation between antiphase or in-phase tilting and uh, the magnetic zelashinsky maria interaction are established. <laughs> Typically, this work uh, is done in such a way. So you can define some magnetic order parameters. For example, the first one is a ferromagnetic order, uh, magnetic, magnetic structure, so uh, the gamma case. So you will see in the in plan, the neighboring uh, magnetic moment are coupling uh, in a parallel way. Well, in the auto plane, so they still parallel coupling. Well, another type is a, uh, R type anti ferromagnetism. So in plane anti parallel coupling 
an auto plane anti parallel coupling as well. Then the third one is uh, the X type uh, anti ferromagnetism. That's the in plane couple uh, by a ferromagnetic way. Well, the auto plane couple in an anti ferromagnetic way. The last one is uh, the M type uh, anti ferromagnetism. So in plane uh, anti parallel, well, auto plane parallel. So of course, so the magnetic alignment can be along Z direction, X direction, or Y direction. So in total, you will have uh, 12 uh, magnetic order parameters. Then combining the octahedral tilting, so omega R, you, it can be along X, Y, Z direction, and omega M, X, Y, Z direction. So typically, structural distortion, you will have six uh, order parameters characterizing the tilting. Then they can be combined with each other to form some trilinear coupling. The trilinear coupling involves some structural distortion like uh, anti phase tilting omega r or e phase tilting omega m. Then another two uh, entries are the, for the anti ferromagnetic structure and another anti ferromagnetic structure or anti ferromagnetic with uh, some ferromagnetic structures. Typically, there are some four. Uh, mechanisms uh, involving some octahedral rotation and uh, some ferro or anti ferro magnetic structure. So this coupling uh, perfectly interprets the non-collinear magnetism in, uh, in various also ferrite or various also chromate and some related materials. So this is some first principles uh, calculation to prove, uh, to verify this formula. So you will see when you change the magnitude of the, let's say the tilting anti ferro distortive vector, you have some magnet magnetization. So it's perfect linear fish relationship. Then we can use the formula uh, obtained by Professor Lon Balish. So for example, the first time, the first term to interpret the non-collinear uh, magnetism in cimmerian ferrite. Typically, in the PBM uh, crystal structure, the antiphase tilting is along that direction. Then this coupling can be expanded uh, into uh, two terms. So here you will see, because of the existence of the antiphase tilting along that direction, typically the pair, for example, the R type uh, antiferromagnetism along Z direction and the gamma type ferromagnetism along X direction should be coexisted. Or for them similarly, the R type along X direction and the gamma type along Z direction should be coexisted and coexisted as well. So it means the uh, the antiphase tilting distortion makes these two magnetic structure uh, align uh, happen simultaneously or these two simultaneously. So it typically in, uh, interpret why the magnetic structure for cimmerian ferrite is non-collinear. And uh, then it uh, establish a, a correlation between uh, magnetic DMI and uh, the tilting distortion. Then let's do the following thing. So starting from the formula developed by Professor Long Balish, we change the M to E so that M DMI becomes, becomes E DMI. Then we change the M to U so that the magnetic moment becomes the uh, electric dipoles. Then we have a formula like this. The question is, does this formula exist in real material? And uh, is it allowed by symmetry? And if yes, how to prove that? <laughs> Typically, the answer is that this uh, delta E, so EDMI couplings are allowed by symmetry. Uh, in our work, we have uh, developed the 12 mechanism for electric DMI. So for the uh, for the couplings involving octahedral rotation and some dipole, uh, typically here, the, the, here are eight different terms. And these eight terms can be summarized uh, to uh, a compact formula in this way. You will see the first two terms are exactly the same as uh, what has been proposed by Professor Long Balish in for magnetic case. Well, we have a uh, uh, discovered two additional terms. And these two terms have been uh, also observed by uh, in uh, magnetic uh, cases. So the, I haven't shown them in this uh, slide. And there are also, also some uh, four additional uh, couplings. So characterizing the non-collinear dipole patterns. So all the 12 couplings can be written in 
in a, a mixed product uh, form. Then it means the electro DMI is indeed exist. So it is very similar to what happens uh, in the magnetic region. Because the uh, uh, formula characterizing the electric DMI are very similar to that characterizing the uh, magnetic DMI, so say at identically the same, uh, the same way in the mathematical form. The by the way, so how to obtain this energetic typical coupling? So typically there are two approaches. The first approach is by hand. So we can uh, do some similar analysis to derive the formula. So uh, the method has been proposed in our recent review. So in this review, we have provided a crash course, crash course towards the derivation of energetic couplings. So this course doesn't involve much group theoretical language. So rather we use some a graphical technique and some symbolic language to, uh, so it is very convenient to derive some uh, uh, some couplings, some phenomenological theory in Freud's materials. And the second approach is by code. So typically some of our authors so have developed uh, L invariant code. So in this code, uh, uh, the energetic couplings for can be automatically generated. And also you can check uh, the isotropy software field use the invariants to get uh, these kind of couplings. So now where are we? Uh, we have shown that in a uh, magnetic perovskite, so like a cimmerium ferrite, there are some non-collinear magnetism. This non-collinear magnetism is basically a superposition of the anti-ferromagnetic structure uh, with some ferromagnetic structures. And we know for a very long time that it is driven by magnetic zelashinsky maria interaction. And then uh, Professor Long Beish have uh, done some theoretical work and uh, it reveals that the magnetic zelashinsky maria interaction is indeed rooted in the tilting distortions. So uh, like uh, the, the tilting of the octahedral, uh, octahedral in, uh, in perovskite, and it is suggested by the delta E, so MDMI uh, couplings. Then in our work, we have derived some uh, couplings involving the tiltings and uh, some uh, cycle patterns. And uh, basically it has some, uh, has the same mathematical form than the, uh, the, the formula characterizing the non-collinear dipole patterns. So by comparing delta E MDMI and the delta e, uh, EDMI, you can see that uh, the MDI, delta E MDMI and delta E uh, EDMI has one-to-one -one correspondence. So this, uh, so this uh, implies that the EDMI is actually existed and again has one-to-one -one correspondence with MDMI. Then the second question is how to verify this uh, delta E DMI couplings. Basically, we can do that by first principles calculations. So uh, what is our strategy? The strategy is like that. So we start from uh, some, so we look at a material system like a bismuth aluminate. So it is a, a typical ferro-electro material. And now we, start from the cubic material, let's say the cubic face without uh, any structural distortion. And then we create the anti tilting along Z direction so that omega RZ is non-zero. Now omega RX and omega RY is zero. Let's uh, check, uh, let's check the couplings omega R cross uh, these couplings. Then given the anti tilting along Z direction, then we impose the structure by some uh, anti ferro electric uh, dipole patterns in such a way. So it's an R type uh, structure along X direction. Then, because of the coupling, so you see omega R is along Z direction, omega Z is non zero, then the UR is along X direction. So this coupling implies uh, omega Z, then UR X, then U gamma BY. So it means if there is some anti tilting along Z direction, and uh, if there is some anti electric uh, distortion along X direction, because of the coupling, there must be some ferroelectric distortion along Y direction. 
So this is our proposal that how to verify that by first principles. So basically we do some computational and, uh, or numerical experiments. What we are doing is uh, as follows. So we fix the antithesis tilting omega RZ and uh, we vary the, uh, let's say the URBX. So we change it typically from minus 0 0.02 to plus 0 0.02. We change it. Then we do some uh, uh, first principles calculations. Typically, we do not uh, optimize the crystal structure. We simply do some self-consistent calculations. Then after that, we can measure the force acting on uh, aluminum atoms. So after the measurement, you will see, for example, we can extract the forces associated with, let's say, the gamma, the, the gamma point. We can extract the forces, then we plot the force as a function of the BRX, you can see the perfect linear relationship between the two. So indicated by the red dashed line. So then by first principle calculations, we can verify the existence of uh, these couplings. And uh, typically we have done all the calculations and we verify all the, the 12 couplings here. So, by symmetry analysis combined with some first principles calculations, we can uh, argue that the electric DMI is indeed existent and it has some one to one correspondence between the uh, uh, compared, compared with the magnetic DMI. Then, in this slide, I will show so, some, so we can compare the magnetic DMI and the electric DMI. So we know that the magnetic DMI cause the spin canting, let's say the nonlinear uh, magnetism, and the electric DMI will introduce a double canting, say the nonlinear fair electricity or anti fair electricity. Uh, basically, let's take the uh, ferro, the, the magnetic case as an example. So the magnetic case is given by so the high effective Hamiltonian is given by the DMI term combined with the uh, Heisenberg exchange interaction term. Typically, if there is no DMI, the, uh, the magnetic dipoles, the magnetic moment should be aligned uh, collinear. Then if you have some uh, magnet magnetic DMI, it uh, aligned uh, uh, non-collinear. And the, the spin canting, let's say the, the magnetic moment canting is the characterization of the D over J. And similarly, in the electric regime, uh, because of the exchange interaction be uh, between different dipoles, uh, the dipoles tend to be aligned in a parallel or anti-parallel way, say collinear. Then because of the existence of the e electric DMI, typically the dipoles tend to be perpendicular to each other. So in overall, the competition of the two terms give rise to the non-collinear dipole patterns. So the, the dipole canting is, a measurement of the electric DMI over the electric exchange interaction. So we now measure the, the canting of the magnetic moment and the canting of the dipoles as a function of, uh, let's say, the antiphase tilting. We also know that antiphase tilting is the uh, orig structural origin of the electric or uh, magnetic DMI. We can see that when the antiphase tilting is zero, then there are no cantings for the dipoles or spins. Well, when the Antithesis tilting is finite, you will see the, the canting uh, start becomes uh, uh, finite, so it becomes uh, non zero. Then the slash is the measurement of the dependence of D over J versus omega R. So the slash for the magnetic uh, spin canting is quite small compared with uh, the, the slash for the uh, electric dipole cantings. So it indicates that the magnetic DMI. For example, the, the effect of the magnetic DMI over J. So the D over J for in the magnetic case is much more smaller than D over J in the electric uh, regime. So it's um, in other words, it means dipole has much more chance to count it, to count than the spin. Uh, to finish this slide, let me show you some other possible mechanism for electric DMI. So previously, we have uh, introduced you the uh, octahedral tilting can be <coughs> some structural origin for both the magnetic DMI and the electric DMI. 
basically the tilting is not the only mechanism for uh, uh, electrical BMI. Typically, let's first review some uh, mechanism for magnetic DMI. In the year 2005, so there is some work, let's say spin current model. In that work, it was saying that, it was said that the electric polarization can give rise to the magnetic DMI. That, based on the one-to-one -one correspondence between electric DMI and the magnetic DMI established by our work, we can, we can deduce that the electric polarization can uh, lead to the electric DMI. Well, another type. So in the magnetic regime, there are some block or near type magnetic scatter means. So these type of scatter means are originated from this kind of uh, Landau type couplings. So the nail type of magnetic scatter means is from uh, this coupling. And the block type is from the M dot the curl of the M. Then based on the one-to-one -one correspondence between electric DMI and the magnetic DMI, we conclude that this type of coupling, so the dipole and the curl of the dipole also exist. By the way, this term is also mentioned in the work done by Professor Helinka and his co-authors. <clears throat> then, so by symmetry argument, we see the electric polarization can give rise to electric DMI. Well, uh, these two couplings can also lead to some electric DMI. Now let's uh, make some compari comparison between electric DMI and magnetic DMI. We see the electric DMI, uh, sorry, the magnetic DMI is the bilinear coupling of the magnetic involving magnetic moment here. Well, the electric DMI as well, but remember, the DMI, so this is originated from some structure distortion. Well, the structure distortion is also, in, so it's also some, let's say, cycles. So typically, the magnetic DMI is a coupling between two magnetic moments. So the electric DMI is a couple of, is a coupling of two electric dipole then the DMI coefficient is also a dipole. So it's a trilinear. So basically, essentially, it's a trilinear coupling involved dipole. Here, it's a, it's a bilinear coupling involved magnetic moment intermediate by some dipoles. So let's make a summary to finish this talk. Uh, we have proved that the electric DMI exists, and it can induce some nonlinear ferro electricity or anti ferro electricity. Well, we also show that the electric DMI can be driven by tiltings. So like uh, the magnetic DMI from, uh, driven by tiltings in samarium ferrite and some related materials. Not uh, limited to that, electric DMI can also be driven by some other physical quantities like uh, the electric polarization and some, let's say the, uh, the non-uniform the non-uniform distribution of the electric dipoles, like the curl of the dipoles, and all the, let's say, the, the diverse diver of the dipoles. Then we can draw this, uh, we can draw this picture for electric DMI. Now we use the arrow to characterize the dipole moment. We use another arrow to characterize the uh, uh, perpendicular the dipole moment. And we have constructed some one-to-one -one correspondence between electric DMI and magnetic DMI. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you very much. That was great. So uh, we have time for questions now. And we have some, uh, please uh, type in your questions uh, from the uh, audience if you, uh, if you have questions. And uh, Cyrus uh, Dreyer is also joining us uh, 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 to discuss the paper, and maybe we can uh, start with Cyrus. Yeah, great, very interesting talk. Um, I, I had a few questions, but maybe the one I can start with um, is, so I, I'm, I, maybe you said this, but I'm still a little confused about kind of this, this the driving force for the um, canting coming from the, the octahedral tilts. So, I mean, I can see that, you know, you have these symmetry allowed couplings uh, as you showed, but um, 
you know, intuitively for the magnetic system, we have this picture of, of super exchange being mediated through the, the intermediate atom. Is there a similar intuitive picture in the uh, electronic DMI that kind of tells us why the, the, this K atom has such an effect on the, the coupling? Uh, sure. So uh, typically, uh, because of the time, I haven't shown that. So our co-authors have developed a macroscopic theory to interpret the electric DMI, and the paper is not under, is not submitted, has just been submitted uh, recently. So typically, I can show you that the electric DMI. So typically, the coefficient, the d vector, is you can extract that. You can obtain that by computing the fourth constant between two atoms. And you just uh, uh, extract it. Uh, you just extract the anti-symmetric part. Then it can give you some uh, information about uh, electric DMI. So after seeing that, uh, so it means the electric DMI is somewhat uh, effect, uh, a Coulomb interaction effect. But uh, you see, if the Coulomb interaction, so if you only consider the point charge, the charge charge interaction, typically you cannot uh, get uh, electric DMI because essentially it is an anti-symmetric interaction. So if the Coulomb interaction between point charge are not uh, the physical picture, but if you look at some dipole dipole interaction or the, the charge dipole interaction, typically you can arrive at the electric DMI. So you can uh, obtain, let's say, the anti-symmetric part. And uh, we have also uh, constructed some quantum theory. So the quantum theory implies uh, it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a coupling factor involving, let's say, the uh, electron phono coupling. So typically, when you displace your atom, you displace your atom, you create some uh, local field. And this field will change the electron density, the electron density distribution. Well, the redistribution of the electric density will interact with uh, this atom, so uh, intermitted by, by the K atom. Typically, if you do some calculations, you can obtain the form, uh, let's say, the electric DMI uh, coefficient. Yeah, thank you. Great, great. We have a lot of questions from uh, the audience. Um, 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 the first one is really related to uh, the magnetic DMI. So I'm gonna skip that for now and maybe we'll come back to it later, but let me concentrate on questions related to the electric DMI. So, so uh, someone asked uh, anonymously, uh, the canting of the dipoles, uh, does it only happen in the direction of the rotation ax axis of the oxygen octahedra or uh, can it be in a different direction? So typically you will see the trilinear coupling. So, so like this. So typically the canting, for example, here. So look at this uh, eight mechanism. In this mechanism, typically we uh, so this character. So the rotation is along this direction, which is uh, let's say from bottom to the to the top. It's uh, perpendicular to the to the plane. This plane. Well, the canting you can see. This canting happened in plane. So typically, the canting is perpendicular to the octahedral rotation by this. And it can also be seen by, you see, the, the, the mixed product coupling. Mm -hmm. It means the microlinear happens in, uh, in, in a plane which is perpendicular to the omega r or omega m. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so pra Pradeep Blumar asked two questions. Uh, the first is, uh, what is the size of the interaction? I guess he means in energy. And, uh, and the second is, uh, are dipole, dipole interactions involved in it? Oh, so typically, uh, typically from this you can see, uh, basically um, you cannot direct compare the DIJ with uh, the, uh, you cannot direct compare the DIJ for electric or for magnetic because the units are not the same. So in, the, the DIG for electric is, uh, let's say, uh, electron volt per Armstrong squared. Well, for magnetism, it's uh, electron volt per, per uh, magnet squared. So typically, you cannot compare these two. But uh, you can compare the D over J, typically. The D over J 
uh, it, it can be measured by the canting, let's say. The canting is somewhat, uh, the canting angle, the, the, the tangent uh, 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 canting angle is uh, somewhat given by the, the B gamma Y over BR X typically. After that, uh, you can see the electric uh, dipole want to count uh, much more than the magnetic moment. When relating the energy, you will uh, we will say that. So for the magnetic uh, DMI, so if you change from collinear to non-collinear, so let's say uh, opening the spin optic coupling, the energy changes somewhat uh, uh, about a milli electron volt, right? So if you do not neglect the the exchange interaction, well, the the dipole, if you change that, uh, the the energy can be. Uh, I cannot remember uh, remember well, but uh, it's much larger than the magnetic case. So maybe one, so for example, one point zero or one point zero one or one point zero point one or zero point zero one uh, electron volt. So for example, ten uh, ten or one hundred times than the magnetic type uh, magnetic uh, let's say the energy. But I, I haven't remember uh, well. Can I, can I ask a quick follow-up question on that? Yeah, um, please. So you, you, if I understand what you said and what you show here, the 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 canting is stronger in the electrical case. So why why do we have um, have we observed so many fewer examples of kind of bulk uh, non-collinear polarization than than magnetism? Oh, typically, yeah, very nice question. Yeah, so indeed, uh, typically, um, I think it uh, you see uh, for the magnetic case, magnetic DM, so you see uh, the DIJ, the DIJ is from the structural distortion. So it's somewhat, uh, it, it has a feature of the displacement or dipole. Well, in the magnetic case, it's uh, a coupling involving dipole and two magnetic moments. So for the, so for the magnetic moment, it's trilinear. It's bilinear. Well, in the electric DMI, so this is a dipole, and this is UI and UJ. So you you have trilinear couple for the uh, electric uh, dipoles. So this so hence uh, the electric DMI and magnetic DMI. So from symmetry point of view, they are they are the same, but from uh, in reality, from the couplings, so they, they are very different. So uh, you will see typically it seems that the electric DMI doesn't uh, want to, I, I mean, uh, here, here how to observe that. Here we, we, we force the atom to, you see th this is somewhat a uh, trilinear coupling. So we force the atom to move like this. We do some selective dynamics. We fix the atomic position along the X direction. Then we relax the structure. We obtain some finite uh, uh, displacement along Y direction. Then we compute this. But uh, in reality, the energy, uh, if you do not, if you relax the structure totally, it will go back to the central symmetric uh, case. So yes, you are right. So it means the electric, uh, uh, electric DMI, although it is existent, but uh, it doesn't want to, I mean, the dipole are not willing to be counted due, due to that. So th there are some limited, limited cases, only let's say, uh, here, one, two, three cases. So, uh, for the uh, for the dipole canting from the electric DMI, but recently, so I haven't incorporated that work. But uh, recently, there is a nature work uh, that has been discovered uh, that has discovered some uh, sparrow or, or uh, some sparrow dipole patterns, and uh, it has uh, written three. Uh, sentences about our work. So it is it's said that uh, our work can interpret uh, their uh, observations, but I haven't read that uh, paper in detail, so I haven't uh, <clears throat> involved that work. But I guess uh, uh, there may be some uh, discoveries uh, related to electric DMI, but uh, you, are, you are right, typically it seems this interaction are not willing to happen in materials. Okay, let, let, let's um, go ahead. So, so Professor uh, Shang has a question. Uh, he's uh, now joined us. Can you uh, uh, unmute uh, uh, Zhengguk? Uh, okay, okay, very good. Okay, okay. Great, great. Thank you. Wonderful. It, it's a very nice talk. Very, very interesting. My question is a little bit long, so uh, 
uh, let me start. Uh, so in magnetic DMI, uh, if you combine anti-ferromagnetism with alternating DMI interaction, so plus minus plus minus alternating DMI interaction, that can lead to canted bulk moment, canting moment. Now, uh, again, magnetic DMI case, so if you have a ferromagnetism, ferromagnetism combined with uniform, uh, uniform uh, uh, DMI, uh, that can lead to cycloidal spin, cycloidal magnetic order. Now, uh, uh, in order to have a, a so-called helical, so helical means the proper screw type or spin order, in order to have a proper screw type uh, spin order, I call helical spin order. You need uh, uh, not just DMI, you need crystallographically, uh, you need chiral structure. Structurally, you have to have also twist like this in the case of a magnetic DMI. So uh, your argument uh, uh, that the symmetry requirement for magnetic DMI and electric DMI, they are basically identical in terms of a uh, kind of a, uh, this uh, DMI interaction, DMI vector itself, I think symmetry wise, uh, they are identical. I agree on that. But uh, according to what I described for magnetic DMI, in order to have an uh, effect in, uh, of uh, electric DMI in bulk uh, properties, like a canting moment or helical or cyclical spins, I think uh, the, re the requirement should be also same, I think. So related with that, uh, you know, this uh, bismuth uh, copper manganese oxide system you discussed, bismuth copper manganese oxide, that's uh, dipole order is a uh, helical type. Uh, the crystallographically probably that's not a uh, chiral. Uh, and you, you just mentioned that you didn't do calculation on that system, right? So can you ele elaborate a little bit? And can you also comment on my comment? Uh, yes, so, uh, by the way, so, uh, can you please repeat, so which system I haven't done calculation, I'm sorry? Yeah, so this bismuth uh, copper manganese case, right? Bismuth copper manganese, can you go back? The, the first uh, system is a helical spin order, bismuth copper manganese, uh, yeah. it's a, maybe oh, a little bit this later. One, yeah, oh. that's the one, yeah, yeah. Bismuth copper yeah. manganese yeah. option. Yeah. So this is, okay. a, I call this a helical type order. But uh, before this uh, helical type order, the crystallographically is this a chiral? Yeah. Um, yeah. So so yeah. So very nice question. So typically, yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, I agree. So in the some uniform uh, uniform DMI, so it uh, it's possible to have some uh, let's say helical, helical or spin spiral structures in uh, bulk materials. So like uh, in the lead lead vanadate. So in this material, because of the it is somewhat a uniform DMI, so in planes, so not anti ferro but uh, some ferro DMI, then it can give rise to some uh, uh, spin spiral, so a spiral or helical order. In this in this material, yeah, so there are some uh, there, there are some uh, helical uh, double spiral structures. So the reason why we haven't uh, calculated that yet is because of that. So just so this work uh, is uh, accepted uh, by let's say, um, if I remember correctly, so July, July of the 2012. We have our work at, at the same time, and uh, when we do the proof, when we when we have uh, our paper have uh, published. Uh, I mean, I haven't seen this paper before. So because this uh, paper and our paper are printed uh, almost simultaneously. I see, so, okay. Yeah, after the publication, so the author sent out an email say, yeah, it's very nice that uh, there are some electric DMI, then our work has also this. So, but it is a pity that we haven't uh, seen this work before that. But I see. So, now so I have shown that it, yeah, yeah it so is a very nice structure. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, uh, I forgot, I, I read this paper some time ago, I forgot now. So in that case, uh, there is, uh, a phase transition having this helical dipole order above which you do not have this helical uh, dipole order? There is a phase transition or not? Uh, you mean this? Um, so here we have discussed with, um, with these authors, uh, but uh, typically I do not uh, quite understand uh, this material because, uh, yeah, so there are some, 
uh, we, we have also tried to see if we can do some calculations or some uh, simple analysis, but this system is very complicated. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we're uh, running. Uh, uh, we're running out of time. I just wanted to ask a, 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 a lot. Thank you so much, everybody. I, I just want to ask a last uh, question. I wonder if you if you can relate this to uh, the kind of conventional picture of of uh, of uh, mode coupling, like zone boundary and zone center mode coupling. Uh, I guess that's always uh, maybe collinear, I, uh, but maybe you could say something about that. Uh, uh. I, I'm sorry. Can you please repeat? Uh, sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I just was hoping. Am I? Uh, I think I'm on. My audio yes, is yes, on. Yes. Yeah. Okay. No, I just was wondering if you could relate this to the conventional picture of mode coupling, like uh, you know, like zone boundary, zone center mode coupling. Uh, uh, typically, uh, what one uh, sees is is uh, is. Uh, uh, competition between tilts and uh, ferroelectricity, so that when you have a system that uh, wants to have tilts and it's not ferroelectric, uh, uh, and if it has tilts, then not, except in the improper ferroelectrics where the tilts and the ferroelectricity are related. I was just wondering if you could say something about the relationship between the electric DMI and the conventional mode coupling picture. Uh, mode coupling picture. Uh, so yeah. Uh, uh, that, uh, that may be a little bit related with my question. Sorry to interrupt you, but yes, yes. Uh, you know, I was talking about this uh, alternating uh, DMI versus yes. uh, uniform DMI, yes. and also kind of a cycloidal DMI. Yes. I think that's kind of all related, whether it's zone center, zone boundary, or where. Yes. You know, I think it's all related to the question. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. So here you you can see uh, related. So it is a this is a zone boundary coupling. So because omega is a zone boundary and uh, the this is also zone boundary. And here, so you see the gamma motion is somewhat at the zone center coupling, but uh, mm -hmm. the, the anti-physicity or infisicity are zone boundary. So typically, mm -hmm. what have, have developed are also uh, are all couplings involving zone boundaries. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. But I'm just, uh, what I, I guess I wanted to point out is just, I mean, there's this, you know, people for many years have talked about so mode coupling. And uh, yeah. it seems to me this is a little bit different because in conventional mode coupling, one may end up with a larger unit cell, but you don't end up with uh, these kind of, you know, uh, 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 canted patterns, you know, complex oh, yeah. patterns. So, so that seems to be a difference, but it seems like uh, uh, it's not obvious to me uh, why you get these complicated patterns rather than just a larger unit cell. Um, uh, okay. So, yeah, so typically you see the coupling, so the omega is always there, but uh, you see this, this two. So these two are not, uh, I mean, in a, in a material, so like uh, in a cubic material containing omega r tilting, if you give an electric field along some directions, then you can drive some microlinear. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but typically uh, in the material itself, so mm -hmm. it, these two, so these two happen simultaneously, but in many cases, none of the so none of the material want to have even mm -hmm. even you see mm -hmm. even the, the one motions mm -hmm. so yeah yeah, so I, I, the, yeah i think this is going to lead to a lot of uh new thinking so i really uh really appreciate the talk i uh, we're run out of time uh and so let's pre uh thank uh professor chow uh, uh, again and uh please uh, join us uh in a month uh for on the second uh thursday of each month the next talk will be alexander uh, demkov and so uh, please join us then. And until then, everybody uh, stay uh, healthy and uh, 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 we'll, we'll hope to see you in a month. Thank you all. Okay, we're gonna sign Thanks. off. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, speaker and also Ron organizing this wonderful uh, webinar. Thank you Thank very you. much. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Have a great day.